Mr. Diaz, I understand you have already discussed the warp drive failure with Ambassador Spock? I have. It is imperative that the Ambassador's shuttle be flight ready. I need you both to ascertain the root cause of the system failures he encountered. I'm surprised, Commander. I thought you would have wanted to work on Ambassador Spock's shuttle yourself. I respect the Ambassador and his many accomplishments, but I do not derive any satisfaction from interacting with his shuttle as if it were somehow transubstantiated through its association with him. Especially when I have the entirety of this starship to concern myself with. I am not the chief engineer of this shuttlecraft. The Ambassador asked me to take a look, and I'm ready to crack this thing open. Good. You could learn from Mr. Diaz's focus. I'll take notes. Then I will leave you to it. Make note of any abnormalities in your report. Carry on. One nice thing about Vulcans... Chovak is the only person who didn't look at this and treat me like I was something to pity. Doc says I should get used to it. Doesn't mean I want to be reminded of it every minute of the day. Hey, you won't get pity from me. I think it makes you look tough. As tough as you really are, that is. And that makes you sound pretty smart. I might need you to save me for myself next time, though. <laughs> Come on. Let's get to the bottom of this. Ready to go? All set. Let's run the diagnostic. about your talk with Miranda. You... you do? She sent me a Priority One dispatch right after your conversation. I'm happy for you. Both of you. <sighs> Thanks. But I'm only going to tell you this once. Don't screw this up. Because I would be very unhappy if you tried this out and then, I don't know, six weeks or six days later I have to start splitting holidays between the two of you. All because things went south and you're not on speaking terms. That just isn't gonna work for me. Are you... upset? <laughs> not on your life, Diaz. But you need to be careful. I like my friends and I like our group. I don't want to lose that. Is that thing done yet? Yeah, it's wrapping up. Let's see. The relays along the primary EPS are blown. Backup relays are all intact. An EPS overload from the warp drive could cause that. But how did the shuttle end up dead in the water? Huh. Well, maybe the ship's data recorder can tell us something. They were only about eight minutes from their plotted warp point. No faults, just those warnings. What are they? field became inverted suddenly. I've seen this happen when the center warp coil cracks. A cracked warp coil throws a fault code. Still, we should take a look. Subspace variance out of tolerance. What does that mean? It means the main navigation array lost sight of space somehow. Will the array going offline cause that? Yes, but it should have also thrown a fault code.
there was a complete warp cascade failure. Wow. They're lucky the shuttle didn't turn inside out. Makes me think the computer panicked on the warp field equation. Any one of these failures should have thrown a fault. If it was caused by a system failure. None of this caused the relays to blow. Roll forward to when that happened. Yes, ma'am. So here, they take a moment to get their bearings and they attempt to re-engage the warp drive. There. That's the relays blowing. And look, there's another warp system alert. Now they're all the same. Subspace variants out of tolerance or warp inversions. Finally, there's a complete warp cascade failure. Then it's one of two things. Either a warp coil is cracked, or the navigation array is offline. That makes sense. Divide and conquer. You want to check the warp coils or the navigation array? I'll check the other. Let's not overcomplicate this. One of these systems is likely broken. I'll check the navigation array. Navigation array checks out, so 
It must be a coil. Except it's not. Checked and double-checked. Well, the readings don't lie. Here comes the security detail for the way team. Hey. I'm not here. We're escorting the negotiating team to the surface as soon as they come down from the bridge. I don't want to interrupt some important work. I was just hoping to see you before I go. The captain and the others will be here any minute now. Should be an interesting ride down to the surface. Come on, I'm never too busy to make time for you. That's not true. <laughs> no. But I am glad you came by. Now that's more accurate. <laughs> I gotta be precise with you, huh? Hey, Maris. Aren't these those button pushers you're always hanging out with? And you're the phaser jockeys we always beat in Parisi squares, right? All aboard for Hotari! That another one of the captain's railroad things? <laughs> gotta be. I just usually zone out by the time he gets to the whole, uh, steam engines were the warp drives of their day part. Catch y'all later. You don't want to miss your train. I do have to go. Not gonna lie, I'd rather not leave right now. More important things on my mind. Do me a favor. Come back safe. Deal. Be seeing you. Edsalar de Diaz. If you could float back down to reality, we still have a ways to go. All right, where were we? So, the warp coils in the navigation array are fine, but the nav computer doesn't seem to think so. I'm out of ideas short of field stripping the shuttle from bow to stern. You want to take this out of the shuttle and throw it on the bench? Oh, real hands on maintenance. I like it. Okay, the nav computer is patched into the ship. The ship's computer can double check our work. If the shuttle's nav computer is putting out false data, we'll know it. Let's run through the shuttle's logs again. Running now. Same. Warp field inversion and the cascade failure. However, the Resolute computer doesn't show the same subspace variance. We're in the same conditions that the shuttle was in when it failed. Why wouldn't the ship's computer get a matching result? What if the subspace variance was a momentary occurrence? That's a possibility, and it would explain why the simulation under our current sensor readings failed to reproduce the issue. But a subspace anomaly strong enough to cause a warp field collapse would leave graviton ripples for days. Let's run with the momentary subspace variance theory for now. Roll forward to the shuttle's attempt to re-engage the warp drive. We need the conditions of space around the shuttle at the moment of warp failure. Resuming simulation. Error in warp field calculation. Cochrane formula variables are out of range. That right there. Take the shuttle sensor data from that moment. Computer, why did the warp field calculation fail? Warp field pressure returned non-orthogonal. Results are undefined. That doesn't help. Wait, what if we use a different ship? Put the Resolute into the simulation instead of the shuttle. Yeah, it should warp just fine. Unless... Computer, run the simulation with the Resolute. Resolute simulated. Computer, give me manual control on the warp power. Static field intensity, warp 1.1. 1.2. 1.3. 1 warp pressure is destabilizing. Error in warp field calculation. 
The warp drive has experienced a system-wide cascade failure. Warp field collapsed. Subspace variance is out of tolerance. Cochrane formula results are undefined. Bingo. What-o? The same moment when the shuttle failed to warp, so did the ship. Whatever happened to the shuttle just happened to us. The Resolute will not sustain warp. We can't leave Hotari space. Ambassador Spock, Captain Solana, welcome to Hotari. We are honored you've come. My name is Tylus Altaris, Minister of Diplomatic Affairs. The honor is ours, and this is Commander Jara Rydek, first officer aboard the USS Resolute. You'll find she has a keen mind and unique insight into the dynamics between the Hotari and the Lydians. We are honored to be here, as representatives of the Federation. I'm so glad- These you... must be the representatives of the mighty Federation. The reigning authority in the galaxy. Or so we've been led to believe. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But, either way, we're grateful you've made the time to come to our little corner of the universe. And you are? This is Galvin, and this is Citron. The heroes of the revolt in the mines. Let's hope this is the last time we ever have to come here. If you'll excuse me. I think we're about to begin. Did you hear the arrogance from that guy? I don't know what we're walking into here. But that guy was something. That may be true. But let's keep an open mind going into the negotiations. Hopefully he's just one voice amongst many. Then let's hope he's the outlier. The Hotari have invited us as their guests, so we must show them the proper respect. Ambassador Spock, welcome to Hotari Prime. The honor is mine, Your Majesty. That the Federation would send one of their most respected representatives is not only an honor to the Hotari people and their queen, but a recognition of our stature and importance. Let's get on with it, shall we? With all due respect to the Federation and their ambassador, they have no authority here. We are not members of their alliance. We are not subject to their rule, nor yours. We demand the immediate return of all mining operations to Elidian control, as it has been for centuries and will be for centuries more. That has always been our understanding. That understanding has changed. Then you invite war. And if you cannot remain silent, you will be silenced. But his point is well taken. What is the Federation's interest in this matter? 
Perhaps you would have us trade one oppressor for another? The Federation remains neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution of this conflict. We are here at your request, Your Majesty. For now. I'm trying to keep an open mind here, but it's not easy. I thought they wanted us here. Was there something you wanted to say, Captain? Oh, no. My apologies. And what about the Kobliard? She's not part She can of... speak for herself, can't she? Then let her. Now then, one should know their place. What you might be somewhere else is not what you are here, which is standing before a queen. And a queen deserves respect. A bow is not too much to ask. Is Hotari Prime, heart of the Hotari system. My apologies, Your Majesty. I meant no disrespect. Better. You are Kobliard. Your people suffered brutal treatment at the hands of the Cardassians. Their injustice towards the Kobliard is as unimaginable as it is unforgivable. Not unlike how we have been treated by the Alidians. As much as they'd have you believe they are the victims here, remember it was the Hotari who attacked us. Hundreds of innocent Alidians were slaughtered without mercy in those mines. The blood is on their hands, not ours. Quiet! If after all the Kobliard suffered, you finally had the chance to right that wrong, to get out from under their control, would you take it? Or would you negotiate a peace? There is no remedy for what the Kobliad suffered. And I fear who we might have become in pursuit of it. There is no justice if the oppressed become the oppressor. So I would willingly accept a peaceful resolution if it were offered. That is the real opportunity. You may be right. Unfortunately, that was not the case, was it? No. It was not. Peace is often elusive to those who need it most. The Federation is the most powerful, most advanced alliance in the galaxy. It's widely known we have an abundance of dilithium in our minds. And it's in your interest to secure a steady supply. Your Majesty, if I may. Ambassador Spock would have us believe you're here as a neutral party in the interest of peace. So why are you really here? I want the truth, not your Federation rhetoric. It's possible the Federation has an interest in both peace and securing a steady source of dilithium. One does not preclude or prevent the other. But that's just my personal opinion. Given the Federation has done business with the Elidians for decades, I would agree. It's entirely possible, if not highly likely. What they haven't said but cannot deny is a simple truth. The Dilithium trade would not and will no longer exist without a Lydian involvement. We created it for the benefit of everyone, especially the Hotari. We've given them warp technology. We've let them share in the profits. We've made their lives infinitely better than before Dilithium was discovered. All of that goes away if the Federation turns a blind eye to their treachery. That is enough of your lies! 
The Hotari are quite capable of running the mines. We've done so for centuries. Don't tell me. Who deserves control of the dilithium trade and the mines on town? Who should the Federation recognize? The Hotari or the Alidians? It can only be one or the other, not both. If I have to choose only one, then it would have to be the Hotari. Well said. How could the just and wise Federation make any other choice? <gasps> this is an outrage. The Federation has lost all credibility. The mines are ours. Lydia will not be deterred. We will take back our mines by any means necessary. Then you will see more blood spilled. I am more than willing to address your concerns, Your Majesty. Yours as well, Representative. But I suggest we could have a more productive conversation with a smaller group. Perhaps only the most essential representatives. I suppose there is some sense to that. I hope we meet again. Commander Jara Rydek, Your Majesty. It's been a pleasure, Commander Rydek. Spock and I will cover everything on the diplomatic front. You make nice with the locals and see if you can get some answers. We need to find out why the Hotari are so willing to risk war. What happened in those mines? Soothing. Commander Rydek, I'm encouraged to see the Federation supporting my people. I'm afraid of what might happen without your help. I'm glad to hear it. I just hope you're not the only one who feels that way. I apologize for that. These are unusual times, to say the least. Much is changing. For the first time in our history, the Hotari have the upper hand. We see ourselves as strong instead of downtrodden. New voices have risen up. Old voices shouted down. Galvin and Sidron have become national heroes. Now, they have the Queen's ear. Better or worse, depending on your perspective. I assume they've taken your place. I was one of the Queen's most trusted advisors. And I hope to prove myself worthy of being so again. Which is why you're here. My fear has been that the Illidians will launch an attack and crush us. You've seen their starship, no doubt. They could have retaken the mines whenever they wanted to, but it never happened. And as strange as this may sound, I'd almost say they're afraid. I just don't know what they're afraid of. It's still the same bluster and bravado you would expect from them. But it has no teeth. Like they're afraid of what might happen. Do you think it has something to do with the Ion Storm? Right now, it's stronger than ever, isn't it? It's entirely possible. 
I'm not a scientist, but I do know the storm has knocked out all kinds of systems. So maybe the Elidians weren't willing to risk their ships given all the interference. Since the day of the revolt, Galvin has seized control of the mines and restricted all access. No one's allowed without his personal authorization. And they've taken over a section of the palace with just as much secrecy and security. I'm told it could be something they brought back from the mines. They've made inquiries, but everyone pretends it doesn't exist. I strongly suspect they're hiding something. What do you think it is? I've heard rumors it's some sort of ancient artifact, but I haven't seen it myself. How can we know? I'd better see what's happening. Do you think you can find out what they're hiding? I need to see proof of something before I can make my case to the Federation. I can try, but even if I found it, I might not know what to make of it. Take this. You can use it to capture whatever you find, and then send it to me. Thank you. I will let you know what I find. And I look forward to our meeting again. I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know, but these negotiations rely on the Federation's neutrality, as does any hope you might have for a supply of dilithium in the future. So why you would choose to side with the Hotari escapes me. Without a Lydian involvement, there is no dilithium trade, but clearly you weren't aware. Tau and the mines belong to the Hotari. They deserve to have control. You overestimate their ability to run the mining operation. They have no idea what they're doing. A major Sarlet Arminta, Special Attaché, Elidian Armed Forces. Pleasure to meet you, Commander. I have my issues with the Hotari, but I have to give them some credit. They know how to seize an opportunity. Inciting an uprising the same day as a massive once-in-a-lifetime ion storm. Our assumption was that this storm was just an anomaly. Yes, a very convenient anomaly. At least, that was what we were told. Of course, I wasn't there. But who am I to say otherwise? Something tells me there's more to the story. So what really happened? Well, the official story is that it was the storm that enabled the revolt. How else do a bunch of unarmed, unorganized miners seize control of an entire moon, much less thousands of mines? But I've talked to people who were there. They tell a different story. They say they're lucky to have escaped with their lives. That it was more than just the storm that somehow the miners were able to harness the energy from the storm. I know it sounds crazy. I'm not even sure I believe it myself. But that's what they said. You just answered your own question. How do a group of miners do something that in theory can't be done? That's how. Harnessing the storm. But even if it's true, how does that even happen? You tell me. If you'll excuse me, Commander Ryder. Commander Ryder, I need a moment of your time. Sure. I'm glad you've chosen to side with the Hotari. I knew the Federation would see through the Elidians' baseless claims and protect the interests of my people. The Hotari have suffered enough at the hands of the Elidians. I couldn't agree more. 
I assume you were there, the day the mines were seized from the Illidians. Not seized. Reclaimed. And restored to their rightful owners. Yes, I was there. We had to be decisive. Before the Illidians could even realize their worst nightmare was upon them. Did you have help from someone else? Hotari stands alone against the Illidian forces. We don't need help from anyone. They respect one thing above all else, and that is force. The greater the force, the more certain the outcome. Any talk of making peace is just that, and worth little without the strength to secure it. Which makes me wonder about your ship, the Resolute. Undoubtedly the Federation's finest warship. Ready to contend with anything the Illidians might have in store. Or is that not true? Maybe I've misjudged it. I wouldn't say state-of-the-art, but the Resolute is plenty capable and can hold its own against just about anything. Let's hope so. Because at the moment, it's the only thing preventing them from wiping us off the map. Cedron. A pleasure meeting you, Commander. I'm sure we'll cross paths again. Well, that was a disaster. What happened? The Hotari refused to concede anything, so the Illidians stormed out. The Hotari did not invite us here as peacekeepers. I hope your efforts were more fruitful than ours. Gravitational harmonics failing to resolve. Warp bubble stability degrading. Increase output to maximum. Increasing warp output to maximum. It's happening again. It is evident that, presently, the Resolute cannot achieve warp propulsion. Since our diagnostics rule out any problems with our warp systems or anything about the ship, the problem appears to be the fabric of space itself. Space itself? You're saying something about this region of space prevents warp travel? Prevents it, or can't sustain it. However improbable, that appears to be the case. The storm didn't stop us from leaving space dock and traveling here. But could it still be causing this interference with warp travel? We must follow sound investigatory principles. Do not let an assumed conclusion drive your analysis. Sometimes we need a little inspired thinking, Mr. Chovak. Captain Solano is on his way back from the negotiations, and I want to have some answers for him when he gets here. Indeed. Given the facts at hand, we may be able to deploy subspace probes around the ship to construct a clear picture of the phenomenon. Around the ship? I'll prep a shuttle. I'm setting up a waypoint at a distance roughly corresponding to the edge of our warp field. When we get there, I'll deploy the first probe.
Commander Westbrook, the Resolute systems are calibrated to receive the probe's readings. We are standing by to reproduce the warp field collapse after the first probe is deployed. Thank you, Mr. Chovak. We'll be in position shortly. And, Mr. Diaz, do take care in piloting the shuttlecraft. Now is not the time to indulge in the human penchant for joyriding. Chovak probably isn't such a fun guy to work for, huh? I just don't take it personally. At least I try not to. That's a very mature answer. Shows a positive attitude on your part. Remind me of it when I start complaining to you about the ship's new first officer. Far enough. Transporting the first probe into position. Westbrook here. The first probe is deployed. Understood. We are reading it. We are about to replay the simulation. I can't get a handle on her. Commander Rydek. She rejected my plan to use a deflector pulse against the storm surge. But on the other, she did listen to my advice and use the whole polarity trick to get you through that excursion alive. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the new XO. I'm sure she's a fine officer, even if we don't see eye to eye. But she didn't go through what the rest of us did. You know that. And it's hard to figure out why she'd be the one Solano chose instead of... well... One of us. I've heard some good things. You should at least give her a chance. I'll take that under advisement. Test is running. Warp field collapse in three, two, one, mark. Whoa. All right, that is definitely a problem with the fabric of space. We need to get another probe out there. two points of data, the Resolute and the Probe, we've managed to get an interference pattern. I'm setting a waypoint to a particularly strong area of interference. We'll deploy the second probe there. Listen, I'm gonna give you a piece of advice I wish someone had given me. Make sure you're never just one thing. And don't get so focused on what's in front of your face that you lose sight of the big picture. Before Rydex showed up, the captain pulled me into his ready room and told me he didn't think I had the people skills to be first officer. <laughs> what a load of crap. I mean, if he'd said that about Chovak, sure. I appreciate the advice, Commander. I'll make sure I keep my options open. I don't need to tell you how to operate. You're already well on your way. You're a capable engineer. You're good in the field. Keep up the good work. Who knows? A solid jack of all departments like you could be commander in chief of Starfleet one day. Hell, Admiral Jellico started as a shuttle pilot. And there are places to go in the enlisted ranks, too. I don't know. I'm pretty happy where I am. You must be a glutton for punishment. Lieutenant Commander Chobok has been known to take decades to warm up to people. Close enough. Stop the engines. Deploying the probe. Westbrook to Commander Chovak. We're ready for another sampling of data. Very good. Running the simulation again. Warp field collapse in three, two, one. 
There it is again. I saw it. It seems to be directional. Well, what about the scans? Anything? Here's the readings in relation to our local space. We've got the Resolute, Otari Prime, and the probes. All this interference is overloading the sensor buffers. We're gonna have to triangulate the sensors manually. Got something. These markers indicate peaks in the gravimetric interference patterns. Let's see if I can find some more. Hold up. This is coming from the moon. A beam that blocks warp travel. Aimed right at us. Someone is doing this intentionally. I don't know how they're doing it. This is like nothing I've ever seen. We're under attack and we didn't even know it. We need to stop them. Unplug whatever it is they're hitting us with. Now, look here. It's our current readings of the Ion Storm. These concentrations. They line up with the interference pattern. The storm and this beam, they're coming from the same place. Carter, whatever petty local conflict brought us here, it's just a small part of something much bigger. Presently, we don't have an explanation for how they're doing this. But one thing is clear. This is no fluke. Thank you, Mr. Westbrook. I want a full briefing when I'm back on board. Solano out. A targeted weapon that inhibits warp travel. Coming from the Moon Tau. That would explain the difficulties my shuttle encountered. More importantly, the tenor of the Hotari during the negotiations. And here I thought the Elidians would be the problem. Coming to peace talks in a warship. This wasn't supposed to be so complicated. For all their posturing, every indication is that the Elidians are afraid of the Hotari. They didn't bring their warship as a threat. They brought it because they're scared. From everything we witnessed, I would say that is highly likely. But what are they afraid of? 
Tylus, the Hotari representative, said she thought they found something in the mines. Galvin and Sidron brought it back to the palace, but they're keeping it under tight security. She's going to investigate it. I gave her my tricorder. I expect she'll contact us soon. You found an ally. Why would Tylus help us? Go behind her people's back? It's a fair question, considering. She doesn't like the way Galvin and Sidron have been manipulating the situation. And the Queen. Working with us to go around them isn't the same as betraying her people. Hmm. That may be true. She's certainly more likely to help than the other Hotari we've met. That raises another question. Specifically, what do the other Hotari have to gain in bringing us here, only to make this hostile maneuver against us? There must be some motivation. Unless they changed their minds between when they asked and when we got here. Sidron was very curious when we spoke outside the Queen's chamber. He wanted to know all about us, our ship, the Federation. He wasn't giving any answers. He was looking for them. Well, I'm sure you didn't tell him too much. I don't think the Elidians know what's really down on that moon either. Major Arminta said the revolt defied explanation. That the Hotari miners somehow harnessed the energy of the storm. Harnessed the energy of the storm? Doing that is beyond even our capabilities. So is a weapon that disrupts warp travel. There have been civilizations and entities, both past and present, far more technologically advanced than the Federation. The Elidians and Hotari don't fall into that category. But that is all the more reason to investigate further.